Diamonds have captivated the public imagination for many centuries. Precious and rare, transparent and clear, they became a symbol of faithfulness, love and commitment. Due to their shine, they were compared to the stars. Due to their properties and stunning beauty, diamonds quickly became the most desired of all gemstones. But one diamond rose above all others, a tale of generations of greed, defenders of faith, thieves and warriors, kings and queens, can be attributed to a single diamond, the most popular diamond in the world, the Kohinoor. The origins of the Kohinoor are unfortunately not documented, but there are legends of its beginnings. According to early legends, the Kolur mine, located on the south bank of the Krishna River in modern-day Andhra Pradesh in India, was where the diamond was first discovered by the Kakatiya Kingdom in the Middle Ages. The Kakatiya dynasty, who revered the deity Bhadrakali as their main goddess, is supposed to have set it as the left eye of the statue of the goddess in the Bhadrakali temple in Warangal. According to Mughal legends, the 186 carat Kohinoor is comparable in size to a famous diamond Babur, founder of the Mughal Empire, wrote about. According to his journal, it was taken from the Kakatiyas by Alauddin Khilji of the Delhi Sultanate's Khilji dynasty when he invaded the southern kingdoms at the start of the 14th century and looted them. Babur got the diamond in 1526 as a reward for his victory of Delhi and Agra at the Battle of Panipat, and it later passed down to the next monarchs. Diamonds were considered the most valuable gemstones in ancient Indian history. However, diamonds lost their distinctiveness during the Mughal era due to their excessive quantity. Nowruz, the Persian New Year celebration, had evolved into a time when the people might make political advancements within the larger bureaucracy of the Mughal Empire in exchange for bringing gifts of jewels and money to the imperial family. There were so many gems in the treasury by the time Shah Jahan, the fifth Mughal emperor and builder of the Taj Mahal, rose to power in 1635, that he made the elaborate peacock throne out of many of them. It is said the throne cost twice as much as the construction of the Taj Mahal it was built to be his new throne in his new capital at Delhi. The Kohinoor was one of the gems added to the peacocks on the throne. The diamond lay there as an eye on a peacock, surrounded by gems in a lavish hall of the Red Fort in Delhi. It remained there for several more years. But the fate of the diamond and the Mughal Empire were about to change. The Mughal Empire was in serious decline due to incompetent rulers and challenges from the great Maratha Empire. The decline of the Mughals gave an opportunity to a distant threat. An invader had reached their borders. One of history's greatest looters was on his way to Delhi. Following the overthrow of the Safavid dynasty in Persia two years prior, Nadir Shah, the founder of the Afsharid dynasty, started conducting raids into the Mughal territory in 1738. Soon after, he launched a full-scale invasion of India. This invasion force quickly overran Delhi, where they massacred the civilian populace before starting a systematic theft of the city's wealth and the Mughal Empire's treasury. He saw the diamond when he entered the throne room. When he first received the renowned stone, he yelled, Kohinoor! which in Persian means Mountain of Light. Nadir Shah took away the imperial peacock throne with more than 10,000 wagons of loot, along with millions of rupees, many slaves, and a variety of other priceless historical jewels. On his return to Persia, the Sikh warriors managed to defeat him, freeing many slaves, and they also retrieved back some of his loot. However, the mount stolen was so much that he stopped taxation in Persia for three years. Before we proceed, I just have one request. Please hit the subscribe button as it will help support me create more content and bring Indian history to the world. 
I really need your support and I hope you like the video. After Nadir Shah's death and the fall of his realm in 1747, the Kohinoor passed on to his grandson, who gave it to Ahmad Shah Durrani, the founder of the Afghan Empire, in return for his support. It later passed on to his own grandson, Shuja Shah Durrani, but it seemed the Kohinoor carried with it a curse as he was swiftly ousted following his defeat in Afghanistan and fled to Lahore with the diamond. Shuja Shah would pass on the diamond to the ruler of Lahore in return for his protection. The Kohinoor now had a new owner, Ranjit Singh. Ranjit doubted Shuja and had the diamond checked by the jewelers of Amritsar. He gave Shuja a large reward when the jewelers attested to its authenticity and called it a priceless gem. To allow his countrymen to view the diamond, Ranjit Singh attached it to the front of his turban and rode an elephant in a procession. During significant holidays like Diwali and Dashera, he wore it as an armlet and carried with him wherever he travelled. He would show it to dignitaries, particularly British officers. But paranoia grew. Ranjit Singh started worrying about the Kohinoor getting stolen, as other jewels were stolen from him before. When not in use, he stored the diamond in a very secure location at the Gobindgarh Fort. The diamond was always placed on a camel in a basket when it was to be transported. But great secrecy was maintained as to which camel carried it. There were 39 other camels in the convoy. Only one man knew which camel carried the Kohinoor. His name was Bailey Ram, Ranjit Singh's treasurer. Ranjit Singh began donating his rich goods to religious organizations as he lay dying in 1839 and he named his eldest son Kharak Singh as his heir. The king's sickness took his voice and you could only make gestures and arguments broke out about the fate of the Kohinoor. Ranjit Singh's head Brahmin, Bhai Gobind Ram, stated that the monarch had left the Kohinoor and other gems to the Jagannath temple in Puri. He said that the king appeared to back up this allegation with gestures. Treasurer Bailey Ram claimed that Kharak Singh, the successor, should receive it instead because it was governmental property rather than Ranjit Singh's personal property. After Ranjit Singh passed away, Bailey Ram hid the diamond in his vaults instead of sending it to the shrine. But the diamond would not stay with Kharak Singh for much time. Dhyan Singh, the new emperor's prime minister, led a coup against Kharak Singh. Later, Kharak Singh passed away in a prison and his son and heir also perished mysteriously not long after. The Kohinoor was acquired by Gulab Singh, Raja of Jammu and brother of the Prime Minister Dhyan Singh. Gulab Singh's stay and time at Lahore were both short. He made an effort to protect the widowed Empress during two days of fighting and shelling by Sher Singh and his troops at her fort at Lahore. In exchange for a ceasefire between Sher Singh and the deposed Empress Chand Kaur, his brother Dhyan Singh negotiated the transfer of the Kohinoor. While Gulab Singh brought back from Lahore an abundance of riches and gemstones, the Kohinoor remained in Lahore. Sher Singh acquired the Kohinoor, but his time with the legendary diamond was to be short as well. Sher Singh and Prime Minister Dhyan Singh were both killed by assassins two years later during a coup. The assassins were, however, put to death the very next day after a counter-coup was headed by Dhyan's son, Hira Singh. Hira Singh replaced his father as Prime Minister and crowned Duleep Singh, then five years old, as the new emperor. The Kohinoor was now tied on the child emperor's arm in the Lahore court. Duleep Singh's reign saw the start of the Anglo-Sikh wars, where Gulab Singh chose to leave the Sikh Empire and become the first Maharaja of Jammu and Kashmir. The legends of the Kohinoor had spread around the world and caught the eyes of a distant queen. The last treaty of Lahore was signed after the Second Anglo-Sikh War, which officially ceded the Kohinoor to Queen Victoria and the Maharaja's other positions to the East India Company. The Kingdom of Punjab was then formally incorporated under company authority. 
The Treaty of Lahore had included a special clause just so that the Kohinoor would become property of the Queen of England. Tej Singh, a follower of Maharaja Gulab Singh, who had previously held the Kohinoor and acquired Kashmir from the Sikh Empire via treaty with Britain, served as the lead signatory of the treaty for an 11-year-old Maharaja Duleep Singh. Dalhousie was the governor general in charge of ratifying this treaty. Even some of his British contemporaries criticized the way he assisted in the transit of the diamond. Although some argued the Sikh Empire should have given it to Queen Victoria as a gift, it is evident that Dalhousie regarded the stone as a spoil of war. Duleep Singh was placed in the guardianship of Dr. John Logan, a British surgeon. Duleep Singh moved to England some years later and spent the rest of his life there in exile. Dalhousie received the diamond from Duleep Singh's caretaker, Dr. Logan, on 6th April 1848. In the presence of members of the newly established Board of Administration for the Affairs of Punjab, most notably the President Henry Lawrence, who according to legend left the Kohinoor in his pocket and sent it to the laundry. But luckily the attendant who found it returned it to Henry. They moved the diamond from Lahore to Mumbai. The jewel was secured on February 1st in a little iron safe inside a red dispatch box, both sealed with red tape and a wax seal, and kept in Bombay Treasury while waiting for a steamer ship from China. On 6th of April, it travelled from Bombay aboard HMS Medea for England. A cholera outbreak occurred on board the ship during its tough voyage while it was in Mauritius. The locals demanded his departure and threatened to attack if the ship didn't leave. The ship survived a storm upon leaving and reached England approximately three months later. It arrived on the 29th of June in the English port of Plymouth. While the ship was emptied, the Kohinoor remained until the ship reached Spithead, another port town. The next morning it was taken by train to London and handed over to the chairman and deputy chairman of the East India Company. Several days later, the East India Company deputy chairman officially delivered the Kohinoor to Queen Victoria on July the 3rd, 1850 at Buckingham Palace. The day was selected as it was the 250th anniversary of the East India Company. A year later in 1851, the British public had the opportunity to view the Kohinoor at Hyde Park in London at the Great Exhibition. Large crowds were attracted by its enigmatic past and stated value of between 1 to 2 million pounds. The royals were becoming disappointed with the appearance of the stone and believed it was dull. It was decided by the husband of Queen Victoria, Prince Albert, with the consent of the government to polish the Kohinoor. Moses Coaster, one of the biggest and most well-known diamond merchants in the Netherlands, was hired for the job. He dispatched Levi Benjamin Wurzanger, one of his most skilled artisans, to London. A special mill was built specifically for the job and the modification work began. It took 38 days and the weight of the Kohinoor went down 17 grams, from 186 carats to 105. The significant weight drop can be partially attributed to Wurzenger finding many defects, one of which was particularly large that he felt were vital to remove. The young Maharaja Duleep Singh, the Kohinoor's last non-British owner, was reportedly speechless for several minutes after Queen Victoria showed him the recut diamond. The Kohinoor was set on a brooch to be worn on the Queen. Victoria, however, started disliking wearing the Kohinoor. She became uneasy with the way it was acquired. After Queen Victoria's passing, Queen Alexandra, the wife of King Edward VII, was crowned in 1902 with a crown set with the Kohinoor. In 1911, the diamond was moved to Queen Mary's crown and in 1937, it was placed in Queen Elizabeth's crown. The crown jewels were transferred from the Tower of London to Windsor Castle during the Second World War. They were moved inside a tunnel beneath the castle walls that had been specifically constructed. The Kohinoor was removed from the crown wrapped in cotton and placed in a biscuit tin. 
The idea was that in contrast to the bulkier crowns, this would allow for their quick relocation in the event of a German invasion. The Kohinoor is still discussed today after so many generations. People of India and Pakistan both have asked for its return. Now even the Taliban is asking that it be returned to them as it was also a part of their history. However, it rests in the jewel house at the Tower of London. But that does not mean the tale of the Kohinoor is over. It has seen civilizations come and go. It has traveled through deserts, mountains, rivers, and various cities. It has sailed the seas and crossed oceans. One thing is certain, that is that the sun has set on the British Empire. The UK now faces a tough economic crisis and nothing can be certain. Will the Kohinoor move again? Where will it end up? That we cannot be sure about. But its tale will probably outlast our lifetimes. As they say, diamonds are forever. <laughs>